It is uh, my privilege to present the second encyclical by Leo XIII that we'll be addressing uh, of the nine. Uh, it is on the nature of human liberty, uh, known by its uh, Latin title, it's Libertas Priestantissimum. So that's probably not one you will remember. So uh, I will refer to it from time to time as Libertas, uh, but it deals with the nature of human liberty. It was published uh, and uh, uh, promulgated by Pope Leo in 1888. Now, one of the things that is important to remember, and this came from uh, a very uh, pointed quote by Leo XIII, and it was dress addressed by Allen in his presentation as to why uh, that was the most fundamental uh, encyclical and issue that was addressed by Leo XIII, and that is on Christian philosophy. And uh, he pointed out that uh, as the new age, or as the modern age, was coming about. Uh, one of the things that Leo XIII realized is that the great errors of the modern age would be the result of false philosophies. And so now as we address each one of these various uh, encyclicals, it addresses an error or errors of the modern age that are coming about precisely because of errant philosophy. And so it makes it uh, the foundational uh, encyclical of the nine that are addressed. He also mentioned uh, French philosopher Etienne Gilson, uh, one of the prominent and uh, preeminent Catholic intellectuals of the 20th century. He edited a volume entitled The Church Speaks to the Modern World, The Social Teachings of Leo XIII. This book contains the text of 12 encyclical letters of Pope Leo, with a general introduction to Leo XIII, his life and his teaching, as well as specific introduction and notes to each one of the encyclicals, all by Gilson. Before addressing this particular encyclical in its uh, various parts, the encyclical Libertas, it's worth quoting Gilson's summary of Leo XIII's teaching in this particular encyclical, that is Libertas. And he says this, there can be no such right as that of thinking anything, of saying anything, of writing anything, of teaching anything, and of maintaining every conceivable position about every possible subject. The true meaning of the criticisms of these so-called, quote, modern liberties, close quote, is not that there are no such liberties. Rather, it is that these liberties consist in the firm resolve only to think, that is, he's saying correct liberty, exists only in the firm resolve only to think, to say, and to write that which is true, and only to will that which is good according to the prescriptions of the natural law, of human law, and of their common source, which is the divine law. Now this is a very fine one paragraph summary of Leo XIII's teaching in Libertas, that is on human liberty. And it would be very, very hard to read or hear anything more offensive to modern American ears. It was the Enlightenment thinkers and the French philosophy who began the redefinition of liberty and its separation from the religious foundation. The French Revolution greatly advanced the new meaning. Its slogan, everyone's familiar with it, Liberty, fraternity, equality. The meaning of liberty was changing because the world and the culture was changing when this encyclical was written. Liberty would soon mean that one may do as one pleases, as long as it does not hurt another person. But as we know, and Gilson was very clear, 
There were also differing definitions as to the meaning of truth and even what constitutes a person. In a previous encyclical, Immortale Dei, Pope Leo XIII defined liberty in this way. A power perfecting man and hence should have truth and goodness for its object. If the mind assents to false opinions and the will chooses and follows after what is wrong, neither can attain its native fullness, but both must fall from their native dignity into an abyss of corruption. Whatever therefore is opposed to virtue and truth may not rightly be brought temptingly before the eye of man, much less sanctioned by the favor and protection of law. It may not be rightly thought and expressed, and it may not rightly be afforded the protection of law. Leo introduces this again in paragraph two of Libertas, where he distinguishes between the so-called modern liberties, which he calls the fruit of the disorders of the age. You need to keep that in mind. The modern liberties, the fruit of the disorders of the age, because in just a few minutes, after we go through the foundational points that he wants to make, we're going to look at what he calls those modern liberties that are the fruits of the disorders of the age, and it may be surprising to a number of us. But he calls these the fruit of the disorders of the age and the natural liberty the church has always defended, which he mentions in paragraphs three and four. One of the things to remember as well, and we will look at a, at a future paragraph, one key to understanding Pope Leo in this particular encyclical is that for him, right is a moral power. We have a tendency to throw that term around, it's a right, but to Leo, when he uses this term, he refers to a moral power. What he does in these next number of paragraphs, he begins to set forth the principles that will determine his conclusions later in this particular encyclical. He lays down a number of them in the first 17 chapters or the 17 articles or paragraphs. He's laying the foundation for some conclusions he's going to reach and we will see. In the early paragraphs of Libertas, Leo sets forth the true meaning of liberty. He does this especially in paragraphs five and six. He makes a fundamental distinction between natural liberty, which belongs to man inasmuch as he is endowed with an intellect or reason, and moral liberty, which consists in choosing that good only which is in conformity with the judgment of reason. This whole encyclical is primarily concerned with moral liberty rather than natural liberty. He makes these references and he talks about the working of moral liberty in paragraphs five through seven. He talks about the fact that freedom of choice is a property of the will, but the will cannot act until it's enlightened by the knowledge that is possessed by the intellect. The mind has to have knowledge before the will can act on that knowledge. The intellect makes a judgment as to the good and the will proceeds to exercise the freedom of choice, he says in paragraph five. And then he goes on in paragraph six and he says, it's possible for the reason, however, to propose something that is not really good, but which has the appearance of good and that the will should choose accordingly. In significant measure, this is the problem for all of us. It's choosing a good that is not really good, but it appears so to us, and then making a choice accordingly. He says it's possible for us to think that we're choosing a good, but it's just an appearance. And, uh, and what happens is we go ahead and choose it accordingly. And then paragraph seven, he says, for this reason, law is necessary to enlighten the intellect and the will. So law, in short, is necessary as a condition of human liberty. Now you note in uh, paragraph seven, the last sentence in paragraph seven, he says this, nothing more foolish can be uttered or conceived than the notion that because man is free by nature, he is therefore exempt from law. Were this the case, it would follow that to become free, we must be deprived of reason. 
Whereas the truth is that we are bound to submit to law precisely because we are free by our very nature. Now, in the next two paragraphs, Pope Leo analyzes the notions of natural law, which is written and engraved on the mind of every man. And this is nothing, he says, but our reason, commanding us to do what is right and forbidding sin. And he also deals with human law. In paragraph 11, he finds their common source in the divine law. So natural law and human law both derive uh, their source from the divine law. And he defines the moral liberty of man at this point as the submission and obedience of his will to the authority of God, commanding good and forbidding evil. So Pope Leo XIII makes it clear that this definition of moral liberty perfectly agrees with the respect that is due to established governments. He does this in paragraphs 12 through 14. But it's aggressively opposed, he says, to those whom Leo XIII calls liberals. He does this in paragraphs 15 and 16. Now, it's important to consider the way Pope Leo uh, uses the word liberalism. We have a tendency, especially uh, in America, uh, when we think of liberalism, we restrict it to whatever we think about the politi political sphere. And uh, we have ideas about what, uh, what that means. But when Pope Leo uses this term liberalism in this encyclical, he considers it in ethics and politics what naturalism or rationalism are in philosophy. It means the denial of any divine authority and the refusal to accept it as a rule or law of the will. So when he uses the term liberalism, it's a complete denial of any divine authority and refusal to accept it as a rule or law or the will. He refers to liberals, he refers to liberalism, and he's talking about that complete and total denial. So it brings us back to the fundamental tenet of naturalism. And what naturalism is, is the teaching that nature is all that exists. It, aff it affirms the supremacy of human reason. There is no supernatural, there's no nece necessity for it. Nature is all that exists. And so liberalism is also uh, a, uh, it incorporates the fundamental tenet of naturalism. This li liberalism, he says, is hurtful to individuals and to the state in uh, paragraph 16. And it's worth quoting uh, the second and the third uh, sentence in, in this particular paragraph, where he says, for once, ascribe to human reason the only authority to decide what is true and what is good, and the real distinction between good and evil is destroyed. Honor and dishonor differ, not in their nature, but in the opinion and judgment of each one. Pleasure is the measure of what is lawful. And given a code of morality which can have little or no power to restrain or quiet the unruly propensities of man, a way is naturally open to universal corruption. With reference also to public affairs, authority is severed from the true and natural principle whence it derives all its efficacy for the common good. And the law determining what is right to do and avoid doing is at the mercy of a majority. The Pope notes that all adherents to liberalism hold to these views. Uh, in uh, verse 17, he says that uh, it may be that some particular adherents to liberalism do not hold the specific views, but they limit their belief to holding that man is not bound by any law of God except that made known to him through natural reason. He actually he actually outlines three people in this category of liberalism. Those who completely deny uh, all, uh, all divine authority. He says that there are some who may be in this category that uh, they, they do hold to some uh, authority, but it's from reason only. And reason is the only thing uh, that they're bound to. And uh, 
that that's made known by natural reason. Now what he does is he also mentions a third category. Others affirm that the morality of individuals is to be guided by the divine law, so some admit that, but not the morality of the state. If you look at uh, the first two paragraphs, or the first two sentences of paragraph 18, he deals with this. And uh, paragraph 18, he says this. There are others, somewhat more moderate, though not more consistent, who affirm that the morality of individuals is to be guided by divine law, but not the morality of the state. In other words, they say individuals are guided by the divine law, but the state is not to be. For that in public affairs the commands of God may be passed over and may be entirely disregarded in the framing of laws. Hence follows the fatal theory of the need of separation between church and state. Now, the interesting thing about this statement in this particular category in this day and age is that many modern Christians fall into the third category because the things that he warns about at the end of the 19th century and about this idea that if the individual is under the guidance of divine law but the state is not, you end up with this divisive idea of the separation of church and state. Well, what is deeply embedded in the American psyche and the American political system? It is the separation of church and state. So this third category is a category where Leo says they would be included in the category of liberalism. But we know because of what has taken place in modern society that that will include many serious Christians who understand that this separation of church and state contrary to what he's about to address. Now from this point on, he's through, verse, or, uh, he's through the uh, 18th paragraph. And from this point on, Pope Leo conducts a, an examination of the so-called modern liberties that Etienne Gilson believed to be, quote, one of the most important expressions of the social and political teaching of the Pope. And he names them one by one, and we're going to look at them in the various uh, paragraphs, and it's going to be stretching because of the uh, typical approach that we take in the modern world. The first one he deals with is in paragraphs 19 through 22. He says that the idea of liberty of worship is opposed to the virtue of religion. Look at uh, paragraph 19. He says, to make this more evident, the growth of liberty ascribed to our age must be considered a part in its various details. In other words, we have to look at all these liberties individually in their various details. And first, let us examine that liberty in individuals, which is so opposed to the virtue of religion, namely the liberty of worship as it is called. This is based on the principle that every man is free to profess as he may choose any religion or none. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, he points out, the virtue of religion is a virtue whose purpose is to render God the worship due to him as the source of all being and the principle of the government of all things. Pope Leo XIII rejects the idea that a man is free to profess as he may choose any religion whatsoever, or perhaps none at all. Leo XIII says, denies that flatly. No true virtue, he says, can exist without religion. He does this in paragraph 20, the middle of the paragraph. And if it be asked which of the many conflicting religions it is necessary to adopt, reason and the natural law unhesitatingly tell us to practice that one which God enjoins and which men can easily recognize by the certain exterior notes. These were some of the things that Alan addressed in his talk, <clears throat> that reason can actually help in, whereby divine providence has willed that it should be distinguished because in a matter of such moment, the most terrible loss would be the consequence of error. There's a great loss if one selects and follows the religion of his own choice 
or none at all. He goes on to say that the idea of liberty of worship leads to irreverence of God by the state, to the idea that no one form of worship is preferred over another, and to a failure of the state to preserve and protect religion in paragraph 21. Especially if you uh, look at the, uh, the first sentence. He notes, this kind of liberty, if considered in relation to the state, clearly implies that there is no reason why the state should offer any homage to God or should desire any public recognition of him, that no one form of worship is to be preferred over another, but that all stand on an equal footing, no account being taken of the religion of the people, even if they profess the Catholic faith. But to justify this, it must needs be taken as true that the state has no duties toward God, or that such duties, if they exist, can be abandoned with impunity, both of which assertions are manifestly false. Now, if you look down several sentences, he says, since then, the profession of one religion is necessary in the state. The religion must be professed, which alone is true and which can be recognized without difficulty, especially in Catholic states, because the marks of truth are, as it were, engraven upon it. And in paragraph 22, we now only wish to add the remark that the liberty of so false a nature, that is, the liberty of worship, is greatly hurtful to the true liberty of both rulers and the subject. It hurts not only individuals, but it hurts the state. Religion of its essence is wonderfully helpful to the state. For since it drives the prime origin of all power directly from God himself with grave authority, it charges rulers to be mindful of their duty, to govern without injustice or severity, to rule their people kindly and with almost paternal charity. It admonishes subjects to be obedient to lawful authority as to the ministers of God, and it binds them to their rulers not merely by obedience, but by reverence and affection, forbidding all seditions and venturesome enterprises calculated to disturb public order and tranquility and cause greater restrictions to be put on the liberty of the people. We need not mention, he says, how greatly religion conduces to pure morals and pure morals to liberty. Reason shows and history confirms the fact that the higher the morality of states, the greater are the liberty and wealth and power which they enjoy. Now what we see in society today is just the opposite. You will never ever read a paragraph like that or you will never see it on CNN or on, uh, on Fox News or anything else extolling the virtue of religion to the state. And what he says is that, uh, that Christians make the very best citizens and it is the faith itself uh, that is the cause for this. Now, <clears throat> the liberty of worship is one area that he addresses that is so common uh, today, but he, he moves on in the next paragraph, in paragraph 23, and he moves to another very um, modern liberty that uh, we're all familiar with. He says, we must now consider briefly liberty of speech and liberty of the press. It is hardly necessary to say that there can be no such right as this, if it not be used in moderation, and if it pass beyond the bounds and end of all true liberty. He says there can't be any such right if it's not kept within its proper bounds and used in moderation. He goes on to say that this is due to the fact that it is manifestly contrary to reason that there should be an indifference to truth and falsehood, and justice, and injustice. He does this uh, in uh, the third sentence of that paragraph. He says there is no right to error, which should be suppressed by public authority, lest it lead to the ruin of the state. Especially in the fourth, the fourth sentence, he refers to this. If unbridled license of speech and of writing be granted to all, nothing will remain sacred and inviolate even the highest and truest mandates of natures, justly held to be in common and noblest heritage of the human race, will not be spared. Thus truth being gradually obscured by darkness, pernicious and manifold error as too often happens will easily prevail 
Thus too, license will gain what liberty loses. So he talks about the excesses of this unbridled intellect uh, and says that it will lead astray and it will do damage to the weak. He mentions in the last sentence of that paragraph. The point that he makes here is that if unbridled license of speech and and press is granted to everyone to say whatever and write whatever one thinks, uh, it will ultimately lead to sacrilege. Truth will be gradually obscured by darkness. Pernicious and manifold error will easily prevail. That's why he says license will gain what liberty loses. Liberty of worship and uh, liberty of speech, free speech and the liberty of the press are among the modern errors that he talks about. He also goes on in, in paragraphs 24 through 29, and he, this is a, a very much related one. He talks about liberty of teaching, very related to uh, liberty of speech and press. Uh, in, a, in an academic context, it would be a complete liberty of academic freedom. He takes a lack judgment on this liberty uh, may also be passed as the one on speech in the press. He says again, there's no right to the error. Nothing but truth should be taught both to the ignorant and to the educated. In uh, paragraph 24, he says, there could be no doubt that truth alone should imbue the minds of men for in it are found the well-being, the end and the perfection of every intelligent nature and therefore nothing but truth should be taught both to the ignorant and to the educated, so as to bring knowledge to those who have it not and to preserve it in those who possess it. He says a couple of sentences later, from this it follows, <clears throat> as is evident, that the liberty of which we've been speaking is greatly opposed to reason and tends absolutely to pervert men's minds. Inasmuch as it claims for itself the right of teaching whatever it pleases, a liberty which the state cannot grant without failing in its duty. In faith and morals, God has given the church divine authority and revelation and reason do not conflict, he talks about in the 27th paragraph. He also notes that the church has everywhere and at all times promoted and fostered uh, the truth. And in paragraph 29, he says, on the one hand, they demand for themselves and for the state a license, which, and he's referring now uh, to those who uh, adhere to the tenets of liberalism. On the one hand, they demand for themselves and for the state a license, which opens the way to every perversity of opinion. And on the other, they hamper the church in diverse ways, restricting her liberty within the narrowest limits. Although from teaching, not only is there nothing to be feared, but in every respect, very much to be gained. This is exactly what is occurring, uh, certainly in, in the West uh, today, where they demand for themselves in the state this license uh, that is not given uh, to uh, the church. The church is restricted and there's complete openness and complete freedom uh, to teach whatever one wants, to say whatever one wants, to write whatever one wants, uh, but at the same time, it's constantly narrowing the church. And uh, he notes, although that from her teaching, there is nothing to be feared, but in every respect, very much to be gained. He's already noted the number of the things that are gained by the state uh, from the church. And he goes on in the next two paragraphs, uh, he addresses uh, one last uh, modern liberty when he talks about uh, the liberty of conscience in paragraphs 30 and 31. Another liberty is widely advocated, namely liberty of conscience. Now he notes uh, that there is a certain liberty of conscience that is right and good. If by this, is meant that everyone may, as he chooses, worship God or not. It is sufficiently refuted by the arguments already adduced. He's already addressed that, he says. But it may also be taken to mean that every man in the state may follow the will of God. 
and from a consciousness of duty and free from every obstacle, obey his commands. That, he says, is the kind of true liberty uh, that, uh, that an individual must have. A liberty worthy of the sons of God, which nobly maintains the dignity of man and is stronger than all violence or wrong. A liberty which the church has always desired and held most dear. This is the kind of liberty the apostles claim for themselves with intrepid constancy, which the apologists of Christianity confirmed by their writings and which the martyrs in vast numbers consecrated by their blood. And deservedly so, for this Christian liberty bears witness to the absolute and most just dominion of God over man and to the chief and supreme duty of man toward God. So there is no conscience or no liberty of conscience that allows a person to think and adhere to whatever they want. But there is a freedom, there is a liberty that for an individual to believe the truth of God un unimpeded by any outside sources. One last thing he notes uh, in uh, paragraph 31 regarding this, he talks about the tenet of liberalism that makes the state absolute and omnipotent. And he says that is specifically rejected. By the patrons of liberalism, however, who make the state absolute and omnipotent and proclaim that man should live altogether independently of God, the liberty of which we speak, which goes hand in hand with virtue and religion, is not admitted. And whatever is done for its preservation is accounted an injury and an offense against the state. Indeed, if what they say were really true, there would be no tyranny, no matter how monstrous, which we should not be bound to endure and to submit to. And he says that that must be rejected, that kind of absolute omnipotence by the state. Now, Pope Leo XIII notes in paragraph 32 that his teaching in this encyclical is presented to heal the evils of the day. He names each one of these. He notes that they, are, uh, they must be rejected, but he says that following his teachings on this, they are meant and presented to actually heal the evils of the day, the remedy for which the, restor for the restoration is sound doctrine in paragraph 32. The church most earnestly desires that the Christian teaching of which we have given an outline should penetrate every rank of society in reality and practice, for it would be of the greatest efficacy in healing the evils of our day if we only heeded it, he said. Now he begins to wrap up his uh, principles in paragraph 35 when he talks about uh, under certain circumstances, given the existence of human weakness, the church does not forbid public authority to tolerate what is at variance with truth and justice for the sake of avoiding some greater evil or of obtaining or preserving some greater good. But he notes and warns that a state, the more that a state tolerates evil, the further it goes from perfection. Thus toleration should be strictly limited, he uh, notes in the first sentence of paragraph 34. But to judge aright, we must acknowledge that the more a state is driven to tolerate evil, the further is it from perfection, and that no tolerance of evil which is dictated by political prudence should be strictly confined to the limits which its justifying cause the public welfare requires. If any toleration of evil, for whatever prudential reason, ever goes against the the common good of the people here, then it must be rejected. The temporary acquiescence of the church, he notes, to certain necessities of the times is an act exercise in prudence where principle would prevail uh, if the times actually change. And then he finally notes that the temporary tolerance by uh, the church or in the state in this instance is manifestly contrary to that of religion or to uh, that of liberalism, which allows boundless license with no apparent distinction between truth and error. So, what he's talking about, as it relates to uh, the state in certain circumstances, 
because to deal with something strictly and rigidly uh, in the short term may create a greater evil, sometimes it is not inappropriate as a matter of prudence to tolerate it. He says that's completely different though from liberalism, which tolerates and allows boundless license and no apparent distinction between truth and error. So he distinguishes that in paragraph 35. Now what he does in the next, uh, in the next 10 paragraphs is he does a summary. It's like saying for the sake of clarity, he's going to go over all the issues that he's addressed in, uh, in very short order. And he follows through this summary. He says, man by virtue of his nature is subject to God and thus any liberty except that which consists in submission to God is meaningless. One can't, can't uh, extol the virtues of liberties that are uh, not in submission to God. To deny the existence of this authority in God or to refuse to submit to it means to act not as a free man, but as one who treasonably abuses his liberty. And then he says, the, to reject the supreme authority of God in private or public matters is the greatest perversion of liberty and the worst kind of liberalism. And he refers uh, to this in paragraph 37. The errors of this idea of separation of church and state, he says, are twofold. And so we, we note this. He addresses this in, uh, in paragraph 40. And he mentions the, the errors uh, are two as it relates to the separation of church and state. One, in matters where the state has any jurisdiction, it must be as if the church did not exist in public institutions and customs. So, if there is separation of church and state, he says, if the state has any jurisdiction, then it has to be just like the church doesn't even exist. That's one of the errors. That is the case that we see uh, all the time in this day. And number two, that's in, in, uh, he notes that in paragraph 39, and, and in paragraph 40, he gives the second. While the church may exist, she must do so narrowly and privately without authority to legislate, to judge, or to punish, but only to exhort, to advise, and to rule our subjects in accordance with their own consent and will. So the separation of church and state, he says, has two major problems. One is if the state has any jurisdiction, then it has to be that the, that the church does not exist or like the church doesn't exist. Public education would be a classic example of that today. The, church, uh, the, the state has jurisdiction. It has to be exactly as if the church doesn't, doesn't even exist in that context. But then he says that uh, there's another one, and that is the church may exist, or it may be treated as it exists, but she must do so narrowly and privately without the authority to legislate, to judge, or to punish, but only to exhort, to advise, and to rule her own subjects. She can't speak out on the issues of the day. She can't address uh, public morality. Uh, the church is restricted in this concept of the separation of church and state so that it must remain silent, restrict its uh, jurisdiction in totally uh, to those people in the church. He goes on and he mentions and uh, summarizes in, uh, in paragraph 42 that uh, it's unlawful to demand, to defend, or to grant unconditional freedom of thought, of speech, or writing, or of worship as if these were so many rights given by nature to man. Freedom in these things may be tolerated wherever there is just cause, but only with such moderation as will prevent it degenerating into license and excess. And where such liberties are in use, men should employ them in doing good and should understand them as the church do does. He goes on to say that uh, Christians may generally take part in the administration of public affairs for the common good in paragraph 45. And the church, he says, does not condemn those who, if it can be done without violation of justice, seek to secure independence of their country from foreign or despotic power. Now, what he's talking about in this, uh, in this context is he is saying that is, it's the right of Christian citizens 
that, and the church at least does not condemn it, uh, for citizens to be uh, involved uh, without, if they do not uh, engage in any violation of justice, seeking independence of their country from a foreign or despotic power. But there is no, nothing said about any general right to revolution or anything else uh, as against the state. What we have in this encyclical of Libertas, he addresses uh, in the night, at the close of the 19th century, uh, Leo XIII addresses a number of the modern uh, ills, the, uh, the so-called uh, human liberties that would cause great difficulties and problems in the future. We have seen that occur, and, uh, and we see it occur every day. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the failure to address many of the things are to continue to address because his, his uh, encyclicals had a great impact and, uh, uh, and really uh, uh, staved off uh, an advance of modernism for, uh, for decades. But uh, the failure to continually uh, form ourselves and to understand this teaching uh, has led to the excesses and the idea of human liberty in so many ways that it doesn't exist today. Any questions that, uh, that anyone has on these, these various liberties? That, that is, uh, the question is, is uh, one of uh, a loss, basically, being at a loss uh, to know where to start in our society if these things are indeed true, and they are. And the church is, uh, has uh, taught this. Uh, where does one start in light of the circumstances that we face uh, today? You know, there are any... Uh, I don't know that there's any one answer to that. There are several things that, uh, that do come to mind. One of the things uh, that we will see is, uh, and, and tomorrow we will address it, I, I know at least in, the, in an encyclical I will deal with, is that it's very, very important to have courage and to be bold in professing the truth. Uh, and so uh, the, all of us can do that. All of us can uh, can learn our faith. We can learn what the teaching of the church is. We can learn uh, the, the teaching time memorial of the church and the magisterial teaching of the church, and we can proclaim it uh, boldly. Uh, we can do so as well to the degree that we can in our own sphere of influence. Uh, there are things that are tolerated today, and some uh, have to be uh, with respect to the church tolerating those things as a matter of prudence. And should there be a, a change um, and a, uh, uh, a return to, uh, to the principles of the Christian faith, then that might, uh, that might change as well. But the church uh, must be bold and to speak out and to take its role given it by God. And we must do it individually ourselves in our own sphere. Uh, as, to, uh, as to any means that could immediately turn our circumstances around, I don't, uh, I don't know any. Do, do either of you have suggestions other than that? Where do you start given the, the uh, amazing circumstances in, uh, in the West today? I have a question. Yes, Michael. Um, um, sorry, Dr. Allen? Dr. Fremister? Uh, today, what it would what it would look like, and I'll let uh, Dr. Fenister jump in any time he wants. But 
The, uh, uh, one of the things that, that uh, comes readily to mind uh, on this is that uh, to speak the truth boldly, uh, to, uh, uh, to speak uh, the truth that, that uh, God has revealed, uh, to challenge the underlying presuppositions and assumptions of the philosophies uh, that have led us to the point today. Um, Alan, do you have anything to add to that? How that would look like? I think um, one of the interesting factors is that, is that, that the first question that someone asked me about the piercing of, of the word of God piercing to the quick, uh, the human heart knows the truth when it hears it. And uh, the, the, the enemy of the 